All right, welcome to Highly Questionable. We got Izzy Gutierrez, we got Dominique Foxworth, and we have basketball. And fan. And fans. Lots of fans. How should Julio Jones and the Falcons feel about his comments on Undisputed? All right, so on FS1, to do an Undisputed. Shannon Sharp is like, you know what? I'm going to get Julio Jones on the phone. And he pulls out his phone, and he dials, and he puts it on speakerphone. And then Julio Jones gets on the phone, and he says that he is out of Atlanta, right? He is not going to be back in Atlanta. He says that he wants to win. And then at the end, Shannon Sharp says, all right, man, we on the air. And then Julio got pretty professional about it and then got out here and said, well, no, I'm not going to the Cowboys because the Cowboys were then brought up. Now, how do you feel if you are the Falcons right now? That's the best news you've gotten all week. Look, man, they got salary cap situation. They are not a team that's built to win right now. And Julio Jones only played nine games last year, and he is going into his 11th season. Trading him is a really good idea, except he's Julio Jones and the people love him. Julio just said he wants to leave. Whoo, great. Offers open. Who wants it? We ain't even got to be slick about this no more. <laughs> yeah, I think that the, that the Falcons should be excited about this because it takes the pressure off of them. Uh, trading away like a franchise icon like that now that the icon has made it clear he wants out, it makes it easier. It's him forcing his way out. It's not you forcing him out of town. But I guess you could argue some that it devalues him. When it becomes public that he wants out, it's harder to then – be a hardline negotiator when you know that other people know you can't start the season with Julio Jones on your roster as things currently stand. But the more interesting question to me is how should Julio feel about this? Because we're still unsure if he knew that he was on TV or not. I would be infuriated at my uncle or not, my play uncle or my nephew or my niece, my mama. If she put me on TV without me knowing, I'll be hot because that's something that you can't control. So... The only person in this situation that should be upset should be Quintoris Julio Jones. <laughs> and I totally agree there. I don't know how bad he should look here, though, or how things should change. Because, look, if we can agree, and anybody who watched it might have seen, might have known, like you said, Dominique, that he didn't know he was on television, we can agree there then him saying, oh, yeah, I'm out of there. That doesn't have to be him saying, I want out of there. It could very well be him having discussions with the Falcons and saying, yeah, Julio, we're probably going to trade you. We're going in a different direction. And him saying, I want to win is just acknowledging that because the Falcons are essentially saying, hey, we are going on a rebuild. We will not use you as our primary target anymore. So him saying those two things, not that bad. I don't think that really changes the position of the Falcons if indeed they have been shopping him, if they have been inquiring, because it's not going to surprise those other teams that have called or have have been receiving calls about Julio Jones there. So I think the only person here that looks bad is Shannon Sharp, and he's going to have to do a heck of a lot of apologizing to Julio Jones here. But if they were going to trade Julio Jones, I don't know how much this changes anything at all. All right, so fun fact, Dominique, his middle name isn't even Julio. His middle name oh, yeah. is oh, Lopez. Oh, yeah, and, I know. And <laughs> don't get much more country than your first name being Quinn Torres and your middle name being randomly Hispanic and you being black. <laughs> and then your nickname is some other Hispanic name. I don't like Foley, Alabama <laughs> wow. in the house. Uh, the other thing, though, as I look at this for the Falcons, and I ask this again, if you were going to trade Julio Jones, why didn't you draft a quarterback? Like, maybe they did not like the options that were available at quarterback when it was time to select, right? Like, maybe Trey Lance or Trevor Lawrence were the only two guys they saw in that draft that they really liked. But if that was the move they're going to make, they were ultimately going to move Julio probably after June 1st because it makes it easier on the cap. Go all the way and start working on it at quarterback and tell Matt Ryan you got one year left and then we're moving on. They didn't do that. You know why? Because the Falcons ain't never going to do nothing right. <laughs> is Anthony Davis right to blame himself for the Lakers' loss? All right, Anthony Davis is 5 for 16 for 13 points in their loss to the Suns, right? And the big thing was a lot of shots from away from the basket. Now, last postseason, P.J. Tucker was muscling that dude, and I raised the question. It's like, are you going to be the guy that keeps letting somebody move you backward? He stopped letting himself get moved backward, and when he was going backward, he made shots. But Mason Ginsburg, who covers the Pelicans, makes a great point about Anthony Davis. His shooting in the bubble last year was wildly anomalous for his entire career. Dude that shot in the low 30s on long twos, shot in the 50s on long twos in the bubble last year. 
Is he going to do that again? Because if he's not going to do that again, then he can't play like he did last season. So these teams like the Suns, if they're going to muscle him, are they going to force him away from the basket and he lets them do it? Then the Lakers have a big old gigantic problem because Anthony Davis playing like a superstar is not optional for them. This whole team is built around the idea that they got two superstars and then everybody else just fills in as they can. If Davis doesn't play something similar to what he did last year in the playoffs, then the Lakers got a problem and he will have to blame it on himself because the plan is for him to play like a superstar. And that's always been the issue with Anthony Davis is because, and everybody will say he's got nicks and bruises and things that'll keep him out of the lineup. It doesn't allow him to get in a good enough rhythm for long stretches of time. When he has, we've seen him be great when he was in the playoffs and made a little bit of a run with the Pelicans. He was fantastic. Obviously, last year in the bubble, you saw health-wise, wasn't really an issue for him, and he was in that ridiculous rhythm shooting the ball. Here, the problem is he's still at a place where he can have a game like this and is going to uh, rely on LeBron James. LeBron can't give it to you the same way he has in the past every single night of the playoffs, especially in the scoring category. LeBron's probably going to like downshift to a point in his career where he's just giving you triple doubles every night, but not necessarily giving you up to 40. And it seems like that's where he's at now. So he needs Anthony Davis to score. And three shots around the basket isn't going to get it done, especially against a guy like DeAndre Ayton, who has the physical tools. His awareness isn't always there. He can get beat, whether it be against a good flowing offense or just a good play. Player, and Anthony Davis just wasn't good. So yeah, I think he can take the blame for this one. But I will say my one sort of theme for playoffs in general is game one is the game that's probably going to be an anomaly of the, of the best of seven. So I'm not going to be too harsh here. I wouldn't be shocked if he comes out and has 40 because he had a great game the last time he played the Suns. And LeBron James is historically known for blowing game ones or at least taking them pretty light. Like he never wins game ones in the NBA finals. He lost two game ones in the playoffs last year. So yeah, it's not time to panic especially since it appears Chris Paul can't even shoot from outside the paint anymore so if you are taking all that off the team this might let uh, the Lakers off the hook but I got a math question for you guys I'm looking at the stat sheet and it says to me that Anthony Davis paid, played 38 minutes LeBron James played 36 minutes somehow AD was negative 18 and LeBron was plus two <laughs> How, how is that possible? How many minutes are in a game? I, I don't understand. Like, I feel like some of those minutes had to overlap. And what was LeBron doing in his minutes that AD wasn't doing? Because it's not like LeBron had one of those vintage LeBron James games. I don't know if there's any analysis to take out of that. It just blew my mind when I'm preparing for the show. And I'm like, there's one person on the Lakers who is positive. LeBron James. And he played <laughs> as much as anybody. Up next on HQ. Like, it's one thing <laughs> when you decide that you're going to sign the paper and that you're going to go and that it's your own decision. Carlos Boozer did it one time. You know what I'm saying? However, when somebody just says, you're going to Utah, what if I don't want to? Too bad. You think those guys want to be there? You're going to Utah. That's whack. And Donovan Mitchell, good enough. Everybody, anybody might wind up in a trade for Donovan Mitchell. Like, all y'all yeah. just got to be sitting there. The only dude that might want to be traded there in the whole league is Jabari Parker. That's it. <laughs> Highly Questionable is brought to you by MLB The Show 21. Available on PlayStation and Xbox. Rated E for everyone. Even though they lost, are the Knicks back? Yo, great game in Madison Square Garden, by the way. Which, by the way, has probably not happened since well before the last time I watched the Phoenix Suns play basketball. <laughs> like, the energy was there. The game itself was really good. The playoffs is bringing these scores down to levels that feel a little bit more manageable. And, like, there's a real back and forth to it. And I don't know if I'm ready to say that the Knicks are back because back to where? They haven't, like, actually really been good in, like, 50 years, right? But Knicks fans, oh, they are back, and it was charming, and it was something that told us what we've really lost in the last year from basketball is the energy that comes from people actually being at the arena. And TNT apparently must have thought it was special in New York, because think about this. You've been watching these games. Most of the camera shots on that left to right shot, like the full court shot, they just give you a backdrop. They're not giving you people because they had not been putting people there. But now that people are in the arenas, they're still not giving you camera shots. We're still not panning to that, because I think people are a little bit uncomfortable with it. Right. But Spike Lee and John Stewart and Tracy Morgan showed up at Madison Square Garden and they were putting them on camera and they got that vaccinated section. They were showing those people like they want to let you know Madison Square Garden is back and the NBA is better for it. Trey Young hit a game winner. Oh, and yeah, was incredibly too. efficient throughout the course of this game and only hit one three. 
I think it's a little unfair what the producers are doing here, making us talk about the Knicks being back or not back after losing when Trey Young kind of had the biggest game of his life on the biggest stage, the place that we all call the Mecca. He may have said it was in Times Square, but that don't matter. The man was cooking <laughs> in the big moments, and it was really fun to watch. As for the Knicks, like their MVP, Julius Randle, like he didn't really show up. Alex Burke and I guess Derrick Rose kind of seem like their go-to guys. That was fun. But you're right. As much as I want to give this attention to, to Ice Trey Young, I really enjoyed that game because it was in Madison Square Garden and because the fans were there and because the Knicks seemed semi-relevant. That is something that is weird about basketball. Even though the Knicks haven't been all that good consistently since, I guess, Melo or Patrick Ewan, to be honest, there is something about that arena in the playoffs when it is close to packed and people are playing hard. I'm going to give Trey a break on that one, Dom, because, like, Times Square isn't that far away. And here in Miami, man, they reference South Beach all the time when the Dolphins games are on, and they're not anywhere <laughs> close to South Beach. So I'm going to give them a break there. And I'm pretty sure Bomani Jones is the only person in America who said New York fans chanting F. Trey Young is charming. But, hey, I guess it's just the fans just that are charming. It's not even really what they're saying. But I do think it's a little unfair to say, are the Knicks back and have this conversation around the Knicks when the Hawks did just did what they did. A team that, you know, came back from the Lloyd Pierce early portion of the season to make the playoffs and get this five seed and win a game in New York when all these fans were as excited as ever. I mean, I was covering the Miami Heat when Dwayne Wade hit a game-winning regular season shot in Madison Square Garden and it immediately became a career highlight for him and this should be Trey Young's biggest highlight in his first postseason game. The Knicks on the other hand should absolutely be worried you know again I'm not going to put too much stock into a game one loss but they should absolutely be worried if Julius Randle doesn't really refine his game a little bit and start making those shots frankly because you can't have Alec Burks as your best player in a, in a playoff series so yeah the Knicks are back in the playoffs that's already been established but this was a Hawks game and the Hawks should be celebrating. Hold on now saying F Trey Young is charming because I find myself when I'm watching Trey Young saying F Trey Young. Let me tell you no. something that's happened since James Harden got to Brooklyn that I kind of think about like maybe I'm missing it but you notice he's not doing nearly as much of that insurance fraud that he yeah. used to do. He ain't doing all that swooping and stopping and all that flailing around to get them nonsensical calls. That's all day long Trey Young's game man. It's weak. I hate it. Think about this. Steph Curry became a two-time MVP. You never see him play into superstar calls and he's an actual real live superstar Trey to barge he a man baby stop doing that stuff then <laughs> who had the more concerning loss this weekend the Clippers or the Jazz all right so this depends on what kind of loss it is that we are talking about the Clippers lost a basketball game to the Mavericks and I mean did this happen last year too where they had these struggles in the playoffs against the Mavericks and then they eventually came around and figured it out the problem is they are the Clippers and the producer of this show may have sent me a text saying man they're a bunch of losers in reference to the Clippers but here's what's weird about this we know Kawhi Leonard is not a loser. Say what you want about Paul George. We have seen him have some postseason success before. We know that Rondo is not a loser. It's like as soon as they put on Clipper suits, it gets on them. You can't wash it off. You can't shake it they off. They tried to change their colors. They tried yeah, all types of stuff. They it tried didn't work. everything, man. <laughs> they they owed her worth seventy billion dollars. He done won something, but somehow Ty Lue, he got a ring. But all of a sudden they become Clippers and they start looking like losers. Now the thing for the Jazz though. Donovan Mitchell did not play. He was scratched with an ankle injury, but it's getting weird because apparently Mitchell thinks that he can play. And there's a tension because the Jazz, for whatever reason, think that he can't play. But doesn't that normally go the other way, right? Isn't the team yep. normally trying to get you out there and to make you play? If Donovan Mitchell has fury with the Jazz because they are looking out for him too much, I honestly have no idea what side to take, no matter what the facts are. Yeah, Bradley Beal fought through a hamstring just to sort of make a play-in position, not even to actually play in the playoffs. I will say, I do think of the two, the Jazz is the more significant loss. Not only for that reason, which I'll get back to, but if you just look at the Grizzlies and the way they, if they're feeling themselves, if they got Dylan Brooks and John Morant just going nuts, like, they're going to give Utah some problems, especially without Donovan Mitchell. If Donovan was in the game, he would probably be rusty after missing all this time, and he's not really an efficient shooter anyway, so it might have been even more 
in Memphis's favor. If you have this rift now in between, you're talking well past this playoff series. And I always thought that part of the idea with bringing uh, Dwayne Wade in as part of the ownership group and being an active member of the ownership group is, hey, Mitchell's here to stay because that's basically, you know, a, a mirror image of him, right? They used to call him a Dwayne Wade that can shoot threes. So if there's a problem now and Dwayne Wade isn't going to come in and solve it and keep this, you know, keep this relationship happy for the course of his career, yeah, we could be talking the early signs of Mitchell working his way out of Utah. So I, again, not going to read too much into a game one, which I think I just did. <laughs> but if it continues this way, yeah, much more significant loss. For I mean, Utah. you put on top of it that he got beef with their other stuff. I know him and Rudy Gobert have made up, but I remember this time last year, we were like, hey, wonder, or I guess it wasn't this time, but during last year's playoffs, we were like, hey, wonder if those guys can kind of coexist going forward because they have beef. So yeah, I would be more concerned if I was them. I'm not as worried if I'm the Clippers, even though they may be losers when you put on that Clippers jersey. If you look at the way that game played out, Luka was great. But he shot 45% from three. That's not something that he does. But even if Luke is going to play out of his mind for this whole series, which is completely possible, the guys like Dorian Finney-Smith and Tim Hardaway hitting four and five threes at 60 and and 80%, those guys, they're not going to do that for the rest of the series. And the Clippers had a chance with the lead in the fourth quarter. But those other guys started hitting those big shots. And I can't expect them to continue to do that going forward. If Kawhi Leonard is still Kawhi Leonard, they need to put him on Luka for the course of the game and see if those other guys can pick up the slack. And I don't think they can do. Well, one thing, Kawhi Leonard as defender and Paul George also, they're still good, but they're not the guys that they were in previous years. Now, here's my thing about Mitchell. If Mitchell is trying to work his way out of Utah, that's ultimately what happens whole bunch of the league just got really, really nervous, right? Because that means that they would then have to trade Donovan Mitchell, which means that your happy behind might be going to Utah. Like, it's one thing <laughs> when you decide that you're going to sign the paper and that you're going to go and that it's your own decision. Carlos Boozer did it one time. You know what I'm saying? However, when somebody just says, you're going to Utah, what if I don't want to? Too bad. You think those guys want to be there? You're going to Utah. That's whack. And Donovan Mitchell good enough. Everybody, anybody might wind up in a trade for Donovan Mitchell. Like, all y'all just got to be sitting there. The only dude that might want to be traded there in the whole league is Jabari Parker. That's it. (laughs) Well, we just did the whole, what if Utah loses and Mitchell leaves? What if the Clippers lose? Kawhi Leonard's a free agent, and people have him going to Miami via free agency. He ain't going nowhere. Why? You don't think he wants to leave Paul George to the Clippers? That dude loves living in San Diego so much that he commutes. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. He ain't going nowhere. Go play for the Padres. I think Pat Riley might let, him, might let him continue that and just commute from San Diego to Miami. <laughs> Up next on HQ. There's something in this game that reminded me of Carl Malone. I hadn't seen since Carl Malone. Giannis got a tense entire playoff. It might have set the tone that poorly. Tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, Game 2, Heat and Bucks. By the way, uh, shout out to Phil Mickelson, who won the PGA at age 50, which did not make our show. But I tell you this, if he had found a way to blow it like I thought he would, it would have been the first thing we (laughs) talked about. Anyway, last play of the game here, Chris Middleton. Players like LeBron's first year in Miami. Dwayne was better at getting those shots that require you to dribble this game that reminded me of Carl Malone. I hadn't seen since Carl Malone. Giannis got a 10 second the entire playoff. It might have set the tone that poorly. Duh, he had that lemon booty to the tune of like 13 seconds. They gave him some grace. <laughs> Dominique, you intrigued? Yeah, that was a painful thing to watch, but they were lucky enough to pull it off. Absolutely. I'm intrigued by this game tonight. The Heat, uh, that first game was kind of sloppy. The Heat gave it up towards the end. But you're right. In that situation, it's all about self-awareness. We're critical of these guys because they don't hit these big shots. Then we're critical of guys who take over a situation when they aren't meant for that situation. Like, we have to accept that Giannis is what Giannis is. Giannis is not a game closer. Like, that's what you bring other guys in. Giannis is going to get you to that end of game situation, but nobody wants the ball in Giannis's hand at the top of the key with clock counting the down heat do. with a jump shot. <laughs> yes, the, the yeah, Heat would love that. <laughs> You're right, the Heat do. All right, that is our show. You'll find us just all over the place. We do a lot of television and radio and podcasting and, and everything else. And Izzy, it's about time for a new background. I've got like this yeah, one, I think so. a little numb. Mm-hmm. Foxworth ever uh, forget he was on the right time and just show up 37 minutes late like he did on Wednesday last week? I don't think so. <laughs> nah, I respect Bomani. I would never do that to him. <laughs> no.